What's up guys, Chris, welcome to my channel, VA Travels. Uh, I make vlogs visiting historical sites uh, in and around Virginia. And uh, occasionally I'll do one of these videos from home where I give information on a site maybe that no longer exists or, or that's not accessible. So yeah, gonna make a video on Brompton, historical home in Fredericksburg, sits up on Maurice Heights, uh, kind of overlooking the city. Um, I'd say about a mile west of the Rappahannock River. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a private residence. Um, can't, can't visit, but you can get a good view of it if you visit the Fredericksburg Battlefield Park, um, standing from the sunken road there, you get a pretty good shot of the front. And um, yeah, I was at the Central Rappahannock Heritage Center this past weekend. Uh, I gathered a lot of information, so uh, I'm gonna put it together the, the best I can. And I uh, wanna give them a shout out. Uh, I'll put their link in the box below. And uh, yeah, it's a good place to visit if you're looking uh, for more information on some of the sites in, in the area. So yeah, to get started, uh, story goes back to 1671, where the land was granted to two guys, John Buckner and Thomas Royston. Uh, they was, received a, a grant from Governor William Berkeley to, to settle and chart out the area. And it was originally an Indian campground. So um, fast forward early 1700s, a, a wealthy merchant from Gloucester uh, came up, purchased 10,000 acres, um, that, that would be Henry Willis, and he built his home on Willis Hill. It's the hill south of the Maurice Hill, and he had built a second home. I don't know if it was a home or maybe a dependency on Marie, Maurice Hill. And uh, it's just a, a small four-room four, uh, four room dwelling. And uh, a little on Henry Willis, he was on the assembly that helped establish, establish Fredericksburg as a town. Uh, it was officially incorporated 1728, and uh, he was one of the town's first seven trustees. And uh, a little information, he was married three times. His third wife was the aunt of George Washington. And uh, to name drop further, their great-granddaughter, Catherine Willis, married a guy named Prince Akil Marat, and he is the nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte. So, thought I'd stick that in there. All right, so, yeah, Henry uh, Willis uh, owned the area. After that, oh, and he is, uh, his family uh, lived in the home several generations, and there's actually a Willis Cemetery kind of back in the back of, uh, on the back of Willis Hill there. You, you can visit if you ever visit the Fredericksburg Battlefield Park. After that, the house uh, passed through several hands. Uh, one of the owners was Fielding Lewis. Uh, he owned the big Kenmore plantation there in Fredericksburg. He is the husband of Betty Washington, uh, sister of George Washington. And after that, we moved to 1821, and that's, where, uh, that's when John Marie purchased the property on the Marie Hill. And he's the one who built Brompton. And he built the house sometime between 1821 and 1837. Uh, I get, I get, different, get different dates in there. Um, to tell you a little bit uh, about the house, I would say it's kind of a federal Greek revival style house. Um, any architects out there could probably, uh, <clears throat> could probably tell you better. Of course, there were several, uh, several dependencies on, on the grounds. Um, the only ones I could find information on were there was a detached kitchen to, to the left uh, that now has a covered uh, walkway. Um, there were four uh, slave cabins and, and they owned between 10 and 14 slaves. Um, there there's also was a road going behind the house kind of leading northwest that connected with the Orange Plank Road. Um, to tell you about the interior, um, there was imported green marble uh, that made the mantles that were sitting in each of the wings uh, on the sides there. And, and uh, the, uh, the marble was imported from Italy and it was intended to go to the White House. And uh, there were slight imperfections, so it, it ended up being acquired by the Marie's. Also, there was green ivy on the brick for over 100 years, and that was imported. It came from uh, Westminster Abbey. So, um, kind of interesting. And yeah, the only thing I can tell you about, um, don't have information uh, on what went on uh, at the house before the Civil War. I can just tell you that uh, uh, Jane Howison Beale, I've mentioned her a couple times. She's the one who wrote that uh, diary that was turned into a book uh, talking about what it was like living in Fredericksburg uh, while it was under Union occupation. Um, and just to let you know, if you're interested, you can buy her book on, on Amazon. But um, she had just mentioned in 1851 attending a big May Day festival. It was a big annual event um, celebrating spring. 
And she just talked about how all, all the will to do's uh, came out. Oh, and to give, give some information on John Marie, he was a prominent lawyer, uh, worked for the water company, and he owned a kind of a popular, kind of famous, I guess, a mill, um, sat there on, on the Rappahannock to the uh, south of the railroad bridge. And there's a famous photo from the Civil War of the railroad bridge after it had been destroyed and the uh, mill is kind of uh, sitting to the left there. Oh, also to tell you his great, yeah, great grandfather came from France. Um, he was actually a Catholic priest. Um, and he also lived for a while in England. That's where he converted to the Anglican faith. And uh, he moved to Brompton, England. So hence the name. And then uh, once he was here in America in Fredericksburg, um, he uh, preached at the St. George Parish downtown. And it said, I don't know if it's true or not, but that he uh, taught George Washington. So, yeah, anyway, so yeah, you've got John Marie, and then John Marie Jr. was born in the house. He's probably the most prominent member of the family. Uh, he was Fredericksburg mayor, 1853 to 1854. After Virginia was readmitted to the Union, um, became Lieutenant Governor, 1870, until 1874. Um, he was also a Virginia delegate, represented Spotsylvania County, and he had gone to the Virginia Secession Convention uh, down there in Richmond, and that's where they had voted to leave the Union. And actually, they took their first vote uh, April 4th, 1861, and they had voted not to leave the Union to, to stay. Uh, then a week later, I think it would have been April 12th, Fort Sumner was attacked. Then they had a second vote, April 17th, and that time pretty much everybody voted to uh, to leave. Yeah, after that, fast forward to what the building is most famous, uh, famous for, its uh, involvement in the Civil War. Um, saw action, the Battle of Fredericksburg, the Second Battle of Fredericksburg, and then um, 1864 it was used as a hospital during the Overland Campaign. It was a Union hospital. Um, I won't go too deep into the Civil War. I'll just tell you uh, during the First Battle of Fredericksburg, uh, was the headquarters of General James Longstreet. Uh, and it sits on, on a hill uh, about 400 yards uh, down the hill. In front is the famous stone wall and, and the sunken road. Um, there were still earthworks visible on the grounds right in front of the house. They were dug by a South Carolina regiment. And they're actually still visible if you look over from the uh, street entrance on, on the side there. Um, can tell you also the Washington Artillery out of New Orleans uh, was had nine guns, nine cannons stationed up on the heights. And also there was a military road built behind the house that connected to the southern portion of the battlefield, connected to Telegraph Hill, Robert E. Lee's headquarters, and then stretched five miles south to Stonewall Jackson's portion of the line. So yeah, after that, you've got the Second Battle of Fredericksburg. Oh, and I, I should mention at this time, the Marines had left the property and then the house was kind of taken over, or at least it was cared for by a lady named Martha Stevens. Um, she had a house down at the bottom of the hill off the sunken road that had been destroyed. So she kind of looked after the place, um, took care of some wounded soldiers. So yeah, fast forward to early May, 1863, Second Battle of Fredericksburg. Uh, again, the Heights saw heavy action. This time it was taken over by Union forces. <clears throat> uh, led by General Sedgwick. And then fast forward a year later, about mid-May 1864, like I say, it was used as a, a Union hospital for the Ninth Corps um, <clears throat> uh, for, for uh, soldiers that had uh, been wounded out at Battle of the Wilderness in the Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse. They were brought the 15 miles to the house. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, to tell you, uh, Claire, Claire Barton was one of the uh, nurses there uh, helping out. And yeah, there are many photos from this time. Uh, Matthew Brady, famous Civil War photographer, was there uh, snapping photos. And there's a famous photo of a uh, tree that's a witness tree, a uh, tree in the front yard surrounded by uh, wounded soldiers. The, the tree still stands. And uh, an interesting side note, there were 17 Native American uh, soldiers who were brought uh, from the Battle of uh, Spotsylvania Courthouse. They saw uh, fighting at the uh, mule shoe there. And uh, for any Civil War buffs, they were Company K of the 1st Michigan uh, Sharpshooters. And yeah, there's, there's some photos uh, of them. Yeah, that's uh, all the information I have for the, uh, for, for the Civil War. After the Civil War, like I say, the house was kind of rebuilt, uh, refurbished. And, and that's when they added that giant pediment, which might be a little bit overkill, but uh, that was added to the top. Um, yeah, m many uh, soldiers were dug up. They were moved next door to the giant National Cemetery that was built there on Willis Hill. 
Uh, two Confederate soldiers were taken to the separate uh, uh, separate cemetery there in town. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, the big National Cemetery, those are all just Union soldiers. Let's see, after that, you would have 1873, a guy named John Lane purchased a house, lived there about 13 years until 1886. Um, then it was, a require, uh, it was acquired by Captain Maurice Rowe. He was a Fredericksburg City Councilman, um, worked in the meat industry. Um, he, he was a commander in the Spanish-American War. And uh, the only information I have on the home from, from this time period, um, it was said that the, uh, he had cattle grazing on the grounds around the house. So Rowe family lived in the house uh, up until 1947 when it was purchased for the University of Mary Washington, which actually was purchased uh, for UVA at the time. Mary Washington was the uh, women's division of the school. And that was purchased for $71,000. Um, there was some controversy at the time uh, because a lot of taxpayer funds were used for the, uh, for the remodeling. And for the remodeling, a lot of uh, paintings uh, and furniture were taken, uh, pa paintings from Gary Melcher's, uh, taken from Belmont, his res residence over there in, uh, in Falmouth. <clears throat> and um, oh, and, and during, the, uh, during the renovations, they were still digging up uh, mini balls, uh, bayonets, uh, bones uh, on the grounds. And then uh, it became the, uh, the home for the president of uh, Mary Washington College. And so it's kind of the White House, I guess, uh, of Mary Washington because it's been lived in by all, all the presidents of the school. So, yeah, that's where we're at today. That's the uh, little bit of history on Brompton. All right, so as always, if you like these kinds of videos, like and subscribe. You can follow me on Instagram, <clears throat> support me on Patreon, and see ya.